click on the like button and subscribe to our channel. Also know that you can find us on Facebook under the page name Bible Barker Church. Thanks and have a blessed day. All right, well, good evening. Throttle up, Bible Bible study. How are we doing tonight? Thanks. Nice. That sounds a whole lot better than we had last week. Thank you. We had crickets last week. <laughs> the three of us over here. Anyway. Oh, and Fred. Fred, sit back there and did things. Anyway. Yeah, imagine that. Now, usually he's involved, but he was, he was tired last week. So. Good cold day. Nice rainy. Snowing this morning when I got up. Of course, I, I wasn't awake yet when I saw that, but I, anyway. So, 1 Corinthians is where we are. We're going to do chapter 5 tonight, but I'm going to back up a little once the ladies get settled in over there. And uh, talk about some of the things about what we're doing. Since a couple of you guys haven't been here before, I'll tell you how this works. I'm going to teach you what's in the Bible. And if you have questions, you ask. And if we have any disagreement about anything, we can work it out. So it's not a problem. Not a problem. But you have to know this. What's written in here, I'm going to read out of the ESV, and I'll compare back to the King James, and I'll go back to the Greek and Hebrew if we need to, because I want to make sure that you understand the words that are in here are important. Extremely important. I describe the Bible as um, a book you have to live. You have to you have to step away from the words and envision the picture of what's going on. So you need to know who's writing, who they're writing to, where were they, where were they going, what were they doing, what is it about, why did they say it, why is it important to us now, and how can we apply it to our lives? Those are important things to think about not just read the words. So sometimes I get a little bit passionate about some of these words, but it's all because I want you to understand that this is a living, breathing book. It's not just some old ancient text that farmers wrote down, is what one guy said. It's a living, breathing book. So I'm going to open this up with a word of prayer, and at the end we'll have prayer requests. Okay, so think about what's going on in your life, and Everything gets written down, and I come back and I pray for it during the week. So just know that that's what happens. All right? Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you again for another day. Father, a time we have to get together. Father, a time we have to study your word. Father God, I thank you for the things that you're doing for us, that you have done for us already through these words. Lord, just open my mouth and let your soul pour out. Father, as we, as we study what Paul was trying to tell the church in Corinth, about their attitude, about how they lived their lives. Lord, let us understand that these principles still apply today. Father God, I thank you again for everything you're doing to us, through us, and for us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just a little bit of history lesson, just because, some, like I say, some of you guys haven't been here before. Corinth is a city in, in southern Greece, right? So it's actually on a little... Peninsula, the peninsula, it's, uh, it's got a, a very important trade route. It is easier to go from the Aegean Sea to the Mediterranean Sea by actually dragging the boats across land. Now, of course, there's a canal dug that goes between them. But the city of Corinth at one time was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. So it's a big place. It's really important. Corinth actually stretches from one sea to the other. Okay? And there's a hill in the middle, and it's the Acorsinth Hill. I believe I said that right, Acorsinth. And on top of it are uh, temples to the Roman and Greek gods. Okay, so this is a huge collection of different types of people, different types of religions, and things like that. As a matter of fact, there is a temple up on the on the top to the to the goddess Aphrodite that we're going to talk about tonight because it's important what happened at that temple. But people would come in on the north side, drag it, they would unload their ship, drag the ship across the land, put it back in the sea, put the goods back on it. Instead of sailing down around here, the winds and storms that are down here on the southern side uh, are extremely bad. So they would, they would, it was easier to drag a boat across the, the land than to sail around to the bottom. 
Today, Corinth is still a big, like I say, a big port city. Like they have the channel cut through, simply just so that people don't have to sail around that. And there's a, there's a, a name for it. I can't even think of it right now. But it's uh, those of you that did a med pack or something may know what that's called. But there's a there's a name for this trade route right here. And it's no, it wasn't the Straits. It was something else. But those are the right things to be thinking about. But anyway, so that's what we're talking about. Now, Paul is in Ephesus, which is uh, over here when he's writing this, and it's a year and a half after they built the church in Corinth, okay? So he's been on a missionary trip back and forth and back and forth, and he's sitting there and he's talking to his scribe, and he calls his scribe by name, and if you look at Ephesus 1.1, it tells you who it is, what his name is. And so he's telling this story to him, and that guy's writing it down, and he's going to send it to the church in Corinth. Now, it's been a long time, and they've already had to complain about these guys once before. This is not the first letter to the Corinth church that Paul has written. We have references to it in the book of Acts and part of it in Romans, but we don't have that letter. This is the first letter that we have the complete content of. Okay, So this is just one letter where he's writing to them. And the first thing he says, Shalom, peace of the Lord be upon you. Right? And he goes through this, this great thing about, I'm so excited that you guys are there, that you, you're, you're keeping this church going, and everything's great. Then chapter 2. But you bunch of idiots are acting like fools. Because you have divisions in the church. Do I follow Paul? Do I follow Apollos? Do I follow Cephas? Do I follow Jesus? And then, he, then Paul says, is Jesus divided? Why are you divided? Don't be teaching different things. Some of the things that they've been teaching is, for the Gentiles had to be circumcised to become a Jew before they became a Christian. No, that's not what it is. That's not anything about it. We got away from all that, right? Well, now they're starting to mix religions, okay? And tonight we're going to talk about the Greek mythology part of it with Aphrodite mixed into the, the religion. So that's, that's kind of where we're going to go tonight. Uh, I, I'm kind of glad that some of the other people aren't here because I didn't want the younger kids here when we talk about this because it's sexually specific about what I'm talking about tonight. So if you're offended by um, sexual situations, you might want to tune this out. Otherwise, hang on because here we go. Hang on, here we go. All right, so I'm going to go back into chapter 4 just to kind of set this up. Starting in verse 17, I want to tell you that this, or that, is why I sent you Timothy. So Timothy is in Corinth now trying to straighten things out. My beloved and faithful child in the Lord. We talked about that the other day. Is it his physical child? No, it's his child in the Lord. Because if you know the story, Barnabas poured into Paul, Paul poured into Timothy. Timothy then went and started the churches and continued the work that Paul had done. To remind you of my ways in Christ. Not that he's perfect. This is Paul speaking. As I teach them everywhere in every church. One of the cool things about Paul, if you've never studied uh, Hebrews or uh, Romans, Paul would go into these synagogues, because he was used to it, because he, he grew up a, a Jew, he was a Pharisee, and he knows how the things are structured. They get up there and they read from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and then they read some from, something from the minor prophets, something from the major prophets, and then they ask a question. They say, does anyone have anything to say? Paul jumps up on a bench and he starts preaching. And they can't stop him. That's one of the rules. Once someone starts talking, you can't stop them. So he preaches about Jesus in the synagogues during their services. That's why they always want to take him out of town. They go up to the wives and say, this guy needs to go. And the wives run to the husbands, hey, that guy's a bad guy. We need to get rid of him. So that's what he's doing. You know, he's, he, he's doing this knowing that he's an endanger, endangering himself. Paul was one that went to kill Christians. Now he is a Christian, so he knows what they're after. Him. They're after him. They don't want him to do this. So then Paul says, some are arrogant. I know this. I know how this is. As though I were not coming to you. Now, here's where I, I made this statement last night. Uh, and I'll make it again. It's easier to teach someone who's never heard the Bible than to untrain a Christian about what they've been taught wrong. And that's the truth. So Paul is warning them, look, I'm going to come to you because you, you, you're still messing up, right? But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. It, it, you know, he, need, he needs to make sure that it's God's will. 
and will. Find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. Are they just speaking like they know, or do they truly know because they have the power of God in them? That's what it's all about. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or a whip, the King James says, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? So here it is. You're messing up. Do you want me to come beat you up about it, or do you want to work with me about it? Excuse me. So, you know, he's, he's, he's warning them ahead of time. I'm coming, if the Lord wills. Now, a personal thought of mine, so this is a little Fred note on the side, right? I think Paul knows when his end is coming. And he's trying to get everything done. And if you read the book of Hebrews, even though we don't know if Paul actually wrote it or not, the first 11, 12 chapters are written one way, and the last few are written a different way. Almost as if it was the start of Paul's ministry and the end of Paul's ministry. But I think he knew what was coming, right? And he was martyred. Uh, and he was murdered, basically. So. so that was the end of chapter 4. So he set them up with praise and worship. Then he smacked them down, you bunch of idiots teaching the wrong things. Now he's told them, I'm coming to get you. Be ready. Now, there's a change. We're going to get into chapter 5. Chapter 5 says this, It is actually reported that there is sexual immortality, immorality, not immortality. <laughs> There's a difference between how you act and how long you live. Immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. We'll stop right there. Remember I said that Corinth had a bunch of different religions and up on top of the hill was the Temple of Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the goddess of love and fertility and had over a thousand prostitutes. As part of the worship service, men would go to these prostitutes. That would include some of these people because they're trying to mix the religions together. Because they kind of like going up there. <laughs> no. It is reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Stop. That word for sexual immorality is pornikos. It's where we get pornography from. It's anything that deviates from what God intended to be natural sex between a husband and wife. That includes homosexuality, sex outside of a marriage bed, and the difference between adultery and, what's the other word? Lost my train of thought. Be real. <laughs> um, fornication. So the difference in fornication and adultery is this. Fornication is not have is having sex with someone who's not your marriage partner. Adultery is one of you married to somebody else and you're still doing it. So this one says, and of a kind that is not even tolerated. Not tolerated even. That's how it actually says it. So, again, you've got to think about who these people are. These are not Christians. These pagans, they, they do whatever they want. Whatever they want. Whenever they want. It's, it's, it's socially acceptable in the Grecian formula. No, in the Grecian uh, community to have perverted sex. Now, how do we know this? It's in the writings. It's in what they did. It's in all of their mythology. And we have accounts of things here that it says that you have been doing that even they won't do. So what I get in my mind when I step back and look at this, I, the only reference I have is Woodstock. Not that I'm old enough to remember it. There are those that are old enough here to remember it. Probably didn't go. But it was free love. It was the, it was the sexual movement. It was the... The, the revolution, they said, of, of, of being free. Well, here's thousands of years before that, that's exactly what they were doing. But there was one kind, specifically, that they didn't tolerate. And it wasn't bestiality. That was okay, too. It was sleeping with your father's wife. That would either be your stepmother 
or something like that. Because if it had been their actual mother, it would have said them, his mother. But his father's wife was probably, again, at this time, they had two, three, 27 wives, right? Uh, as somebody said earlier, yeah, how many, how many wives does that one particular religion have, right? Well, back then, that was, again, socially acceptable. As a matter of fact, when Paul writes out what is important for a deacon or an elder or a pastor to be, it says the husband of one wife. It has nothing to do with divorce. It has to do with one wife at a time. That's what those words literally mean. So here, if you're with a father's wife, you're breaking not only Christian values, Jewish values, pagan values, you're just being totally irresponsible. That's disrespectful. That's disrespectful to your father. That's right. So, now here comes the sad part about this. You said that uh, father's wife Yes. Why don't you that Yeah. That, those words mean mean that. Absolutely. What version are you reading? Living translation. Living? Cool. Okay. That's good. That's good. I like that one. But it also breaks down in the middle of the verse. <coughs> when it says something that's going on. Yep. It breaks down and says something that even pagans don't do. Right. Pagans are the are just the freeloaders. They do whatever they want. So yeah, absolutely. So He's saying, one of your people was doing this. Now, a good friend of mine rewrote this recently and read it as a letter, like it was somebody in our church that did this. And it was excellent. It had me going. You, you sat there, kept turning around, looking at me, going, I was like, what are we going to catch it? I, 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 did, I never did. I, I was like, who in the world could it be? <laughs> you know? So... So he's setting them up. Now, he's, he's like I say, he's already smacked them around about doing false teachings and stuff like that. Now he's into them about sexual immorality. And you are arrogant. You do not know it all. You do not have all the answers. You are pretending to know things that you don't know. Ought you not rather to mourn how bad is this? How sad is this? How wrong is this? How is this? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. It is said that Jesus came for anyone who believes. And there's only one unforgivable sin. Right? And that's the, this, the, uh, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for getting that, that word out. But here's that area in the middle. What about all the other sins? Well, specifically, since we're talking about sexual immorality, that also has to do with what you think about someone, or what you say amongst your friends. And one of the issues I had with somebody not long ago was the way that they talked about the opposite sex. Listen, you, you can't be that way and follow the will of Christ. You can't be. They take it to the extreme and said, now you're sleeping with your father's wife. You need to get that person out of your group. They need to be put away even farther than the pagans. The pagans we might be able to reach, but that person has something wrong here when they can't even figure out that's wrong. For though absent in body, I, Paul, am present in spirit, and as if present, like I was there, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. Now, wait a minute. Matthew 7, 7 says, Judge not lest ye be judged. And people love to throw that up in our face. Yeah, but what does 7, 8 say? <laughs> the righteous judgment is the right thing to do. This is a person who... This is, this is a person who will not listen to truth, will not listen to rebuke. This is just a bad person. Get them away from everybody else so that they don't affect them or infect them or whatever. Okay? 
Get that person away from you that did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, I'm going to go over to the next one, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. What in the world could Paul be talking about there? It says, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, when you come together as a congregation or as a family, as the body of Christ, you cannot let that spirit loose in your setting. And my spirit is present. I, Paul, are with you, not physically, but you know I'm there with you in spirit. With the power of our Lord Jesus, in His name, you are to deliver this man to Satan. Wait a minute. The pagans don't even act that way, and they're could be considered, right, Satan worshipers, right? They wouldn't even deal with it that way. They'd kill that person. They would offer him up as an offering to Baal or whoever, right? But what he's saying is turn him over to Satan. Get him away from the Christians. Put him out. Isolate him. Why? Because then and only then, when Satan comes upon him, will he learn how bad what he has done is, and he will repent. That way he may be saved in the day of the Lord. When Paul talks about turning someone over to Satan, it's for their benefit so they can see how bad things are so they can recover from it. Because if they stay in amongst friends, like churches do, they don't talk about the sexual immorality that they have. Uh, for example, I heard one guy put it this way. This, this uh, worldwide church that's... Uh, centered in Rome, <clears throat> has a lot of issues with their priests and underaged children. <laughs> right? Specifically boys. I wasn't going to say it, but yes. And they cover it up. And they don't talk about it in services. And most of the churches in this town you go to now won't talk about it. Why? It needs to be talked about. Not because it's something we need to do. But there's things that need to be done about it. I heard recently a statistic that blew my mind. I don't remember numbers. But in this area even, human trafficking has gone up. In Nashville, they put out alerts saying, don't walk alone, male or female. Okay? This is bad, people. This is bad. And the churches aren't talking about it because they don't think that that's the right to put in front of their congregation because it's a negative. No, we need to talk about it. Because there are people, even in our congregation, who have had sexual problems in their past. Whether something done to them or done something to someone else. And I'm not calling out names and I'm not pointing a finger at any single person in this place, but listen to me. This is a problem that needs to be discussed. Because we need to not have our children or our grandchildren go through this. Whether they're physically our children or they're adopted or anything, we can't do that. Stepchildren especially. How many times do we hear a female specifically saying, my stepfather raped me when I was 14? No. no. We have to stop this. And how do we stop it? It's by talking about it and getting people to understand it is not that person's fault. The, the victim is not to blame. Which is what so many people want to do. Well, if they hadn't acted that way. No! It's wrong. And that's what Paul's saying. Get this person away so that Satan can tell him how bad he is. And that maybe he'll cry out to God and get forgiveness. Otherwise, he's going to start infecting people. Those words are not in there. That's Fred's words, but that's what I read when I read that. You're boasting. You're talking about it. You're, 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 you're above it all. You have, you have no problems in your congregation. You have no problems in your church. Our, our people are perfect. No. No. Your people are broken. That's why they're there. They're looking for peace. They're looking for resolvement of what is going on. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So, 
even though I don't bake a whole lot, I understand that any yeast in with the dough will make it rise. Yeah, it would make it rise, right? One bad apple in a bunch will spoil the bunch. One bad onion in a batch will make them all sour. A potato that has started to sprout will infect others to do the same. Right? So that's what he's saying. A little leaven leavens the whole lump and you've got to start from fresh. So why don't we clean out all the problems by talking about it and telling people, hey, here is what is wrong. Let's fix this problem instead of trying to ignore it. I apologize for spitting. I'm a little, just a little excited about this one. This one gets me because I've seen it. I've seen what has happened with people who get tied up in these situations. It says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. I've been called an old lump all my life. Now I want to be a new lump, right? <laughs> As you really are unleavened. Now, just a moment ago I said a little yeast makes the dough what? Rise. And what is it that's making it rise? The yeast makes it rise, but what is it that's growing? It's gas. He's saying quit being an old gas bag. Oh boy. Well, you know, if you let bread rise and then you punch it down, you're punching out gas. As you really are full of gas. That's what he's saying. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And that part's over. Let us therefore celebrate. Celebrate the festival, not the old leaven. The leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth and integrity. Right? Right. I said that for you, Brenda. <laughs> Throw that up there. Anyway, so look. <laughs> He wants them to stop acting the way they've been acting, stop living the wrong way, and get rid of these fools. This one particular fool does not call him out by name. There are a lot of people that try to pin it on another person that Paul talks about later, but I, I don't know about that yet. But he's like, look, let's not live under that anymore. Let, let, let's not do the sourdough thing no more. I love sourdough. But that's what he's saying. Get rid of all that. And let's go back to flatbread. <laughs> Unleavened. Clean living. Moral living. Not having extramarital sex living. No more sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your partner. Right. But that's what he's saying. You've got to stop all of this. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. We think this is a reference back to that first letter that we don't have. We just have references, references to it. But he said not to be sexual, immoral, sexually immoral, meaning that they can't do what the Greeks normally do. They can't have same-sex sex. They can't have extramarital group sex. They can't do any of that stuff anymore. That's wrong. So he's writing this to the people at the church of Corinth, which also includes converted Jews, who would know that most of the stuff is wrong anyway, but to converted Greeks who lived that way for a long time. Was that... 300 boy lovers. There you go. There you go. So Paul's all excited now, but then he says, not at all, meaning the sexual immoral of this world. <coughs> I'll come back to that. Or the greedy and swindlers, different set of parameters. Or idolaters, another set of parameters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. <coughs> it is man's nature, the sinful nature, by fact of the, the things that 
Adam and Eve did that got passed on to us that he's talking about here. Now, not the sexually immoral of this world, meaning that you still have to go out and teach these people the truth. Those are the people that have never heard the gospel. So here's what you need to think about, <coughs> especially reading Paul. Is he talking about the administration and the people in the church, or is he talking about unchurched people? And right there he switched to unchurched people. Because the sexually immoral are the ones we're going after. We're going after the ones who have had these issues, not to beat them over the head and tell them how bad they are, but to show them that through the love of Christ they can get out of that. They can get past that. They can, they'll never get over some of it, but they can learn to deal with it, learn to love who they are again. Now it says, or the greedy and swindlers. Greedy and swindlers, those that are after money. So how many have heard that incorrectly stated, money is the root of all evil? I've heard it. But that's not right. Do <clears throat> you know what it really says? The love. For the love of money. It's not money that's bad. It's that greed, that want, that desire. What I had years ago, I had to make more, make more, get a better job, get a bigger house, get a bigger car, get a new car, get a new truck. <clears throat> <laughs> or idolaters. What is an idol? Anything that you worship besides God. Exactly. Anything that gets between you and God. Even a new motorcycle. Even even playing in a band. Even 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 just 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 having a piece of property can be your idol. Now, there are studies out there that show this. Whenever idol worship goes up, sexual immorality goes up. In that temple that I was talking about are thousands of prostitutes and thousands of idols because the idol worship and the prostitution went together. There's been a lot of studies about that. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Everybody, everybody, Okay, so that's the Lord. Uh, anyway, so, so you have to go out of the world, meaning that you could not talk to anybody. But that's not what he wants them to do. He wants them to not have problems in the church so that they can go and talk to these people. Okay? Yes, sir. When you get down to this part right here, <coughs> and really read into it and everything, okay, now out in the world, that's where we're supposed to be going to right. tell people about Jesus, to tell people what Jesus did. Uh, introduce them to a relationship with God and with the people in the church that's what it's talking about is the or, or the people that ought to know better because they've been taught to know better but it's also put down in the part right there too if you've done it to the point of having a label of that's what you are because usually if someone uh, commits adultery they would say well, that person committed adultery, they made a mistake, and they've come back and they've prayed to God and they've tried to make things right. But if they continue to do it, then they become an adulterer. Yes. And the same way with uh, the swindlers and the greedy, is people that you do something and you slip up and you kind of get over on somebody because for one reason or another and you swindle them. Right. Then you go back to that person and make it right with them and they would say, well, the guy got over on me, but we've since made it right because uh, you know, we knew it was the wrong thing to do. But if the person continues to do that, then they're, they're actually kind of trying to get in between you and God and cause you to feel like, uh, you know, you don't need to come back to church no more because there's somebody in the church that's constantly ripping you off. Yeah. And it become a swindler, not somebody who made a bad deal but who's constantly doing stuff like that. So it's uh, the people in the church that have, have been doing enough that that's what people label them as because that's what they are. Right. Right. Very good. But that's that's exactly who we have to be accountable for to keep them away from yes. our... What we've been seeing happen. Yeah. Uh, what's the word susceptible? Susceptible. Yeah, is that the right word? When they, they're easily attacked without knowing. Yeah, impressionable. There you go. All right. But now, 
I am writing to you, not, not the time I wrote to you before, but this time, <coughs> to associate with anyone who bears this name of the brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, arguing with people, drunkard or <coughs> a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. <coughs> you can't be in the same place breaking bread with someone that you know cheats somebody else or has been a, a child molester or whatever. And that's what he's saying. You, you can't do that. You have to keep yourself pure. You have to keep your flock pure. You cannot allow those people in as long as they still do what they've been doing. Yes, sir. But it also, it also doesn't say that if you're out somewhere witnessing the people, so <coughs> you've got people living, <coughs> uh -huh. and you're having a meal, and somebody orders a beer, it doesn't mean get up and walk away from the table because that's not a drunkard. That's somebody that's having a drink. That's fine. And as long as they're not, you know, that's that's one thing that it, it doesn't say who will take a drink of alcohol. It says drunkard. Right. And and the 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 emphasis on that word, the structure of how that sentence put together, means that it is a person who is losing control of themselves. Exactly, no self-control. Right. Not not just somebody that's tipsy. I mean, someone who is making a fool of themselves, can't control what they say or what they do. Um, heaven help this man. I, I used to be a bartender, and this guy came in, and we would hate to see him come in. He'd come in, he'd spend money, and he'd drink wet himself, we'd have to clean it up every Friday night. So but that was a long time ago. And then there's there's also <coughs> we witnessed it before at a church scene. There's someone who was a uh, was not a believer. Right. That was right down the road on the way to the bar. They had already got themselves drunk. Mm hmm And they said God or they said for some reason they felt like they needed to be right there at the church. Yep. And asked if it was okay if they went up to the altar and if someone would pray with them. But at the same time before that happened, there were already a bunch of people in the back of the church saying the guy didn't need to be there because he had drank some alcohol. And so see you got the people in the church that are guilty of just about every one of these. Every church has this problem. Yes. And they don't address it. And usually the church that has the problems going on, the problem is sitting in the back talking about someone who doesn't have a relationship with God that comes in the way they are and feels like they should be able to tell them to leave. Right. Which makes them the same as a gossiper, mm -hmm. which is on the same level as all of these other sins. Right. Exactly. Everybody okay with that? Understand? Questions? Okay, because he changes it up again. For what have I to do with judging outside? With judging, <coughs> I don't know these people. I don't know this person. He's not part of my group. What purpose do I have in judging him? So we go back to Matthew 7, 7 and says, judge not. Again, we've got to go up to 7, 8 though to see the rest of it. Is it not those inside the church who you are to, Matthew 7, 8, judge righteously? Right? My brother, I'm going to pick on you. And it's not personal. If I didn't know you, and if I didn't know anything about you, how you live your life or what you do outside the church is none of my business. But you're part of my group. You're part of my people. You're my brother. If I see you doing something that is not right with God, I have the not only the right, but the responsibility to say, hey man, not, not pointing my nose down at you or my fingers at you or anything, saying, hey man, what can I do to help you with this situation? That's righteous judgment. You were talking about that the other night, and that's what kept running through my head. We have people that have all kinds of hurts, hang-ups, and habits, and they're trying to figure out life, and we can help. We can. Not fix it for them, but help them to figure out how God can help them 
And that's where the righteous judgment comes in. Not, you're wrong for doing this, man. You shouldn't wear dark colored jeans. I mean, you know, just something, right? I, I was going to say skinny jeans, but I didn't want to embarrass you. So, <laughs> look, look. We wouldn't do anything. And I only do this because I know that you got a good heart. You know, and you don't understand that I'm just making an example. We'll do everything we can to help you. We don't want to hurt you. We just want you to know your walk with God is right. That's how I read this. Who am I to judge somebody outside that I don't know, that I don't care about? I can't, but I can show them the right way. God judges those people. Purge the evil person from among you because they will, they're a bad seed. They, they, they will stir up strife. They will cause more divisions. They will cause major confusion. They will cause people to think, well, if that church allows this to happen, why should I be a part of that? I can't go to that church anymore because they won't, allow, they won't fix this problem. We don't need that. One of the problems that we have is you think about the church in Corinth. Okay, we know up the hill was a place of ill repute uh, and things like that. But I wonder how many of uh, the churches of Corinth, like that one, was it was within a three block radius. Because what happens is there are so many churches in 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 every town, <coughs> and so many different denominations that if it gets to the point where you tell someone you can't do that here and you you either need to get it right or you gotta go. They just go right down to the church right down the road and they stir up the same thing there. The churches don't communicate so the same problem revolves around. So they church hop. Yeah. That's that's the term I've, I've come yeah. across. They they are church hop or they create their own church. Yeah, but wouldn't that come into the swimming? Yeah. Sometimes, yes. Under that yes, absolutely. So, and then the churches that we have nowadays have become more of a business, of a way of making a living, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and things like, like you said, things that are overlooked because they don't want to talk about it, uh, or they want to cover it up. And on top of that, though, it's become the type of thing that new people coming into the church, the unbelievers that come in as believers are basically brought in and taught that that's the way it is. So yeah. they don't know, so they still don't know any better because right. they're taught that it's okay. It's right. It's really not. It's not right at all. Yep. Well, we can't stop, <coughs> you can't stop that like you can't stop a letter. Can't stop Facebook like you can't stop a letter. Oh yeah, it's just mom. Mom made a point of this the other day. She said for us to be able to talk about somebody back in my childhood, we had to write a letter and wait for weeks for them to get a response back. Now it's instant. Or tell the or tell or tell people about the church or complain about things to people behind their back and stuff like that. So. Anyway. So Paul, Paul, like I say, he's just he's he's fanatic about this because he wants that church to thrive and survive, not not for numbers, not for money, not for anything like that, but to reach those people there that are living a life that is not going to get them into eternity with God. So he's saying you got to stop all this foolishness in your congregation. So that people won't think that's the way things are, so they can live right. So they can live right. That church down the hill from the Temple of Aphrodite had issues. And Paul, being a good brother, tried to help them. Brings up the crusade again. We know that there are churches in the area that have problems. We can either talk about them 
talk to them and help them or cover our eyes and forget about it. Paul said in back and forth, that is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved. The verse right before this, 16, says, Therefore, be imitators of me. Because that's what he's wanting to do. He's wanting to be the person that can help out. Because that's what he was told to do. And that's what we're told to do. Okay? Questions? Comments? Concerns? Confrontation? Why is your beard longer than mine? Because it's been growing for a long time. I took fifth place in a beer competition in the fall. We had a we had a ZZ Top guy, man. It was all the way down to his belt, and his hair was all the way down past his knees. <laughs> he he was full on, man. But uh, it's all right. First place in the chicken show. Excuse me. It's the first place in the chicken show. Also second and third. My chicken is worth. My chicken. Now when he's not coming. <laughs> He was the only one competing at this. Yeah, it was, it was his house. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to do stuff in the FFA. I remember something in first place on one motorcycle uh, contest. <laughs> trophies and all this. I, I have a, well, I gave the trophy to my artist, but I got a first place trophy for my uh, American Spike uh, tattoo. All right, then, if that's all, then uh, we'll go ahead and do our private and personal prayer request. We'll turn off the camera, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in.